We're in the lead training program, lesson 10, what is the doctrine of Balaam? All right, so what we're going to basically teach our families this week is we're going to walk through, uh, I, I decided to include last week's tour portion along with a little bit of this week because the story is just, a, it's a continuation story. It's a really important to have the backstory in order to have the full story. And so how often in our lives that uh, that we jump in on someone's current story and we don't have the backstory and it's really easy to judge based on uh, the information that we have. So we want to dive into the full backstory here of Balak, who he is, Balaam, who he is, and how this whole story uh, unveils and unfolds before our very eyes. There's some significant points that we're going to bring out uh, as we go through here. So first and foremost, we are going to read Numbers 22, 1 through 6. So this is what you're going to do. I didn't print it off because I'm assuming that We'll be able to uh, walk through it on your own. But we're going to go to Numbers, what I say, 22, 1 through 6. Okay? Let's go all the way up here. It'll be easier. Just... There we go. All right. So this is King Balak sending for Balaam. So the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. King Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam the son of Beor at Pithor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is blessed cursed. Okay, so what I want to bring up from this very simply is that King Balak is highly confident that Balaam can bless and curse at his own will. And uh, so let me just pull this back over here. It's important for you to understand culturally what this is all about. There were mediums, there were soothsayers, there were diviners, uh, witchcraft, was very, very prevalent in these days, it's in the Egyptian days as well. And you see that in the 10 plagues when they when Pharaoh called upon his own diviners to do witchcraft, to try to duplicate uh, what, what Moses had done. So you, it, you have to understand, in their culture, this is not something uh, that, that really people freak out about. It, it's, it's very prevalent. It's almost normal. Uh, you know, today... You don't really see that. You know, the average person doesn't see these type of things. But back then, it happened, and it happened a lot. People were tapping into the what's called the second dimension and getting answers or getting favors uh, from the quote-unquote gods of the time or the evil spirits, the fallen ones. And so in this particular context, Balaam is one of those people that was very famous uh, for his prophecies, many of them coming true, because he had the ability or he, at least he thought, to manipulate uh, the gods. And he did that in all kinds of various ways. And so because he had a very high reputation of be being able to manipulate the gods to curse or bless, uh, they called upon him to do such that. So let's go back to the scriptures here. And we're going to read uh, seven, verse 7 through 18. Okay, let's make this full screen, make it a little easier for you guys. Verse 7, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I'll bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Now remember, Balaam uh, is is he contacts all kinds of gods. 
the, he understood who the God of Israel was. That's why he says, I'm going to go talk to Yahweh and find out what he has to say. He's got to approach the God that has jurisdiction over that particular people. And this is a good point to remember and a point that you can bring up to your family, especially young children, and all of us really need to be reminded that nobody can touch us outside uh, of God giving them, uh, giving them the right to touch us. God has jurisdiction over his children. Yahweh has jurisdiction over the Israelites in this passage, and if you are a child of, of God today, uh, then you are owned by Christ. He purchased you with his blood, which means that he has jurisdiction over you. Satan, by law, must do exactly what Balaam is doing here. He must go to Yahweh and ask, just like he did for Job, he must get permission to touch you because we are in jurisdictional status with the Lord. And that's what Balaam is doing here. So going back to the text here, it says uh, in verse 9, Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me to you, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for Yahweh has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. So King Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, meaning I'm going to pay you like you've never been paid, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam that night. Actually, I think that's where we're going to end here. Let me check my PDF. Is that where we're supposed to stop? Oh, I, I went one verse too far. Okay, so let's go back here and take a breather and discuss a little bit about this whole section right here. So Balaam goes back. Uh, to the servants of Balak and says, look, I, it doesn't matter if Balak gives me everything he owns, I will not and cannot go beyond uh, the, the word of the Lord, my God. Now, this can be kind of a confusing passage for those that are just cursory reading this uh, in the English because it appears as if Balaam uh, is a servant of of Yahweh, and he's a prophet of God. But this is the farthest thing from the truth. You have to understand soothsayers and people that were in his position, their, their job is to manipulate the God that they are uh, entreating. And he knows that Yahweh is hearing everything uh, that he's saying, and every time he calls upon the name of that particular God, it is his God. He is going to honor that God he is going to respect that God. He is going to do whatever sacrifices is necessary for that God in the effort or with the intention, I should say, of receiving something back from that God. So don't be deceived uh, if because the, the text actually says that he's, he's, he comes across respectful, that he's going to uh, stay within the confines of the Lord, his God, this is not his God by any stretch of the imagination. It is only his God for a moment. And that is the moment that he tries to get something from God so that he can receive the bounty or the money from King Balak. And although I don't believe I have this in the slide itself, it's important for you to, and every time that we do this, I always let you guys know, make sure that you take notes because I'm going to come up with things that that I did not uh, and did not put inside the PDF. So you need to always be taking notes so that on uh, the next time that you have family church, you can bring up some of these things. And one of the important points to bring up is that how often, uh, you know, we look at King, we look at Balaam and we say, 
uh, what a terrible person he's using God. But don't we do the same thing sometimes? Don't we, you know, pray like never before? We entreat God like never before when we want something really bad or when we're in a pickle, right? So when we are in really big hot trouble and the hot, the hot water keeps getting hotter, uh, we tend to really come before the Lord. That's when like fasting is easy. Getting up in the morning, praying is easy. Now, any other time uh, in our lifetime, uh, fasting, praying, coming before the Lord, like really putting yourself uh, at the feet of his throne, it's like pulling teeth. It's the most difficult thing in the world. To, I don't have time. I'm so busy. But in the reality, it's situational desperation that creates the time, interestingly enough, isn't it? That if our situation is desperate enough, we seem to find the time. And it's no problem uh, to get up early in the morning. It's no problem uh, to, to skip a meal or to fast and pray. And, and that is exactly part of the doctrine of Balaam, is Balaam uses God for his own purposes. It doesn't even have to be monetary gain. But he uses uh, the gods for his own purposes. And then he drops them and goes to another God. And uh, I find this exactly the way that modern-day Israelites uh, uh, do it uh, today, is that we, uh, we, we, we go before the Lord when we need something from God, but we really don't go to him uh, every day like we should. Okay? A uh, question about the diviner. He was in witchcraft. And so uh, this is, a, in, in the text, actually, it says a little bit later uh, that Balaam chose to not use his regular uh, methods of divination. Instead, he did something different, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So, yes, he was definitely in witchcraft, was, was also a prophet, but he was a cheating prophet. He used divination for his prophecies, okay? All right, so uh, let's go back to the PDF real quickly here. Whoops. Okay, there we go. So some of the discussion here is Balaam appears to be a servant of the true God, Yahweh. In verse 18, he even says that no matter how much money Balak offered, he would not go beyond the word of the Lord. It sounds so noble, does it not? Is Balaam a true prophet of God? Is he being genuine? What do we know about Balaam that allows us to doubt he is genuine? At this point in the story, we know that he's a prophet for hire and that he had the reputation that he could bless curse, and manipulate the gods into doing his will. To be a prophet for hire, he had to be cunning, devious, and a master at witchcraft. He was not a prophet of God, even though he calls Yahweh, quote, my God. In order to manipulate the gods, he was respectful to them. However, the next verse brings out what was truly in his heart. And so if you look at Numbers twenty-two nineteen, it says, Therefore, please... You also stay here tonight so that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a big giveaway that Balaam, what's in Balaam's heart. God had already told him, no, you cannot curse these people. Do not go with them. What does he say the second time around after they offer him the world? He says, well, you know, God says I can't go, and uh, but let me just go and just stay one more night and let me ask him one more time. Let's see what else I can do. And this is the attitude uh, of, of Balaam. Balaam's attitude is laid back. Uh, it's, hey, I can't do this. It's deceitful, but let me just ask God one more time and, and see what happens. So one of the questions that I brought up, uh, and by the way, up here in red on the points of discussion, you know, discuss those matters. Let your kids or, 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 or whoever's in your Bible study discuss, based on the information that we know, what uh, we know about Balaam and is he really a true prophet? Because at this point, it's difficult, it's more difficult, but if we look a little deeper into where he comes from and what he does for a living, it becomes clear he's certainly not a prophet of God. One of the questions is this, why does this verse begin to unveil what is really in Balaam's heart? And again, uh, the answer is because God already told him no. Going back to the Lord to ask again shows the witchcraft in his heart. 
He believes he can manipulate the God of Israel like he manipulates the other gods uh, around him. And then this is another question of, 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 to ponder and, and to really discuss. Do you ever find yourself asking God for something that he has already said no to? Is it because deep down you don't like the answer and you're hoping that he'll change his mind? Try to remember the last time you pressured God into changing his mind. How did that work out for you? I know for me, it never works out. Like children, sometimes we keep pushing our father to say yes in an area that he's already ruled no on. It usually doesn't work out very well for us at all. And I can tell you this, that having uh, you know six girls, I've got four at home, and I will tell you that my youngest ones are notorious, my youngest for sure. Uh, she is, uh, you know... Uh, but she's a pistol and super, super smart. And she'll ask a question. We'll say no. She'll ask the same question four different ways, four more times. And it starts to get on your nerves as a parent, right? When the child, it just she just won't stop. When the child continually pushes, continually asks from different perspectives, at some point, you kind of lose your cool, right? You said, look, I, I said no. Uh, and then sometimes, I'm not going to lie, as a parent, I'm doing a hundred different things. And this, quite frankly, it's just dawning on me why she probably continues to push, is because probably greater than 50% of the time, I go ahead and say yes uh, as she's pushing because I've got so much work I'm doing. Uh, and in the moment, I don't have time to do this trial and vet all the information and all the evidence. And so she makes a halfway decent case. So I end up overturning my own judgment uh, and letting her do what she wants to do. And then later, I find out she goes above and beyond uh, what I told her to do, and she gets in trouble for that. So I really feel like, uh, as Israelites, we're really good at this. We're really good at pushing God. We're not that far off from Balaam. Balaam is doing something that is very uh, common uh, to humankind. It's human nature to do that. So let's go back to the Scriptures and read verse 20 through 22. And, uh, and see what it has to say. It says in verse 20 right here, God came to Balaam at night and said, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Then watch this. This is so fascinating. It says, Then... It says, then God's anger was aroused because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him and he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now, I don't know about you, but this is kind of a confusing passage, is it not? It appears as if Yahweh just gave Balaam permission to go and then all of a sudden, Balaam goes, and God gets mad. That's just not fair. And I know that if I told my daughter, hey, you can go out and play with your friend, and then uh, five minutes later, I get mad at her when I see her playing with her friend, something's not right. I'm creating an atmosphere of schizophrenia. So here's the question that we want to definitely ask uh, in this scenario, is if God just told Balaam to go with them, if they called on him, why was God so angry with him when he rose in the morning and went with the men? Is God schizophrenic? Why would God punish him for something he just told him he could do? Now, this is a great time for you guys to stop and ask your family members or people in your Bible study what's going on, uh, what, what's happening. Let them come up with their own ideas. Let them think. One of the, the things that I do in our family Bible study is we really try to focus heavily on critical thinking. This is also really good education if you have younger kids. Uh, to, it's like going through homeschool right here in Bible land uh, where they get to die. They have to pay attention because I'm going to ask them questions along the way. And I encourage you to do that as well. Don't read super long sections of scripture. Uh, break it up into smaller pieces and then ask them what this section means to them. Tell them to put the whole section in their words. What this does is it allows you as a parent, uh, as a leader, to make sure that the group that you're leading understands what's happening 
uh, all along the way. Don't take for granted that the people that you're leading understand what's being read. Uh, they are all too easy and eager to shake their head that they understand when most of the time they don't. So make sure that each section, every paragraph, even sometimes a few verses, you stop and say, hey, uh, can you put in your own words what this means? What do you think is going on here? And uh, let them answer. And that'll kind of give you a bead on how much they're, they're following along the scriptures. So the answer is this. When we go back to verse 20, so let's do that. Let's go back to verse 20 here so you can see this. It says, God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. All right, the key word here in the instruction that God gave them is if, if God, if they come and entreat you, then you may go. This was a great company of men who were not staying, staying in Balaam's uh, house. It wasn't staying in Balaam's tent. Remember, he, he, this was a lot of princes and a large uh, convoy. So they would have set up their own camp outside of, of Balaam's area. And so God basically said, look, this is different than the last time where they stayed with you. If they come to you, to your tent, then you can go with them. And what do we find? We find that Balaam did not wait for them to come. Early in the morning, he saddled his donkey and he took off and he went with them. This is why God is so upset because he jumped the gun. We already knew what was in his heart. We already know he has an entire history of working for money. And uh, uh, hold on one second. I'm getting a notice saying that, uh, that the Zoom link is not working. So hopefully it's the right link. But um, in any case, so we already know the reputation of Balaam. We know that he has absolutely no context for doing things the right way. He's a, he's a, he is a prophet that is a, into witchcraft. So the key verse here is that when God says, if the men come to call upon you, then you can rise and go with him. And then it says that God was angry. And the reason why is found in verse 21. And so in verse 21, we have the Hebrew here, and it makes it super clear. So let me show you this, because when you see the Hebrew, the text does not say, ki halak, okay, which would mean that he went, but the text actually says, ki holek hu, right here. Ki hulek hu. That literally means he went of his own head. He went because of his own mind. He made up his own mind and he went. Not that he just went, but he went of his own volition, as we would say in English. He went based on what was in his own heart. So the Hebrew gives it away. Balaam didn't wait for them to come. He went on his own. And so uh, the question I put in here is, have you ever jumped the gun? Have you ever gone beyond the word of the Lord? If you have children, ask them if they ever go beyond your instructions because they really wanted to do something. It is our nature to do what we want to do. We do what's in our heart. And we consistently and constantly look for ways to get around God or the authorities in our life to do it. Do you find, uh, brethren, that this happens to you sometimes, that you you just kind of do what you want to do and it's frustrating you that that you got to you got to keep the Shabbat and you can't go out to dinner that day or or whatever and, and, and you kind of want to do it so bad and all you can think about is doing it. Well, man, the more that you think about it in your heart, the more it's going to likely be interpreted by the Father that you've already done it. So you might as well go out to eat that afternoon because that's all you can think about. That's all you care about. It's, it's not in your heart to, to do the right thing to please your Father. No more than a wife, uh, a, a husband, I should say, gets no brownie points if he tries to please his wife just because or his wife wants to be pleased, but he doesn't really want to do it. He just does it to check it off his list. There's no points for that. At least I have found in 25 years of my own marriage, I do not get credit 
for doing things for my wife that I don't really want to do. I only get credit when I do things that please her with a cheerful heart because I love her and I want to please her. It's the desire to please someone that causes them to be pleased. Not so much the action itself, but it's the desire behind it. And that's something else that you can write down and bring up during family church is that make sure you you let your children know that. That, hey, look, we're not trying to just get you to be obedient. And, and by the way, uh, well, let me finish that thought. We're not trying to get you to be obedient. We're trying to get you to desire to be obedient because you love us. You see, there's a big difference between training children to obey you and training them to want to obey you. There's a big difference. Uh, mis- probably one of the biggest mistakes that parents make, if I could uh, go on a diatribe for just a moment, but one of the biggest mistakes that parents make in raising children is that they get the children, and they can get the children to obey because they're stronger than the children. They're smarter than the children, right? They can leverage all that they have as an adult against the small child. And the child will have to obey. Even a father with a 14, 15, 16-year-old can leverage that. But I can assure you, at some point, the child will most likely be stronger uh, than the adult. Might even be smarter in some ways than the adult. Certainly more deceiving. And they will find ways to get around uh, the ability to obey or the instruction to obey, I should say. And so I think it's really important that as parents we understand that we're not trying to mold the behavior. That is not our goal as a parent, to mold the behavior. Our goal as a parent is to mold the heart. It is to bring instruction to the heart. It's out of the heart the mouth speaks, right? You want your kids to speak uh, behind your back in the same way that they would speak in front of your back. So if you uh, if you tell your kids that they shouldn't curse and blah, 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 and, either, blah, and they, they'll just curse when they're not around you, uh, and you'll never know it. It's the heart that we're, we're after. Everyone does what they believe. So it's not important that you take your belief system and you, you know, throw it down or shove it down your child's throat. It's important that they understand what you believe and that they adopt that belief system. Because if they believe it, they're going to do it. And that's been just my experience, uh, just a couple of minutes there on parenting. For those of you that have kids out there, it is critical that you spend more time molding the heart. And one of the ways you can do that, by the way, is, is in, I love, but Cheryl thinks I'm crazy, but she does understand the power of it, that when one of my kids does something wrong, uh, that's, that's serious on, on a level, it doesn't matter how old they are, uh, it's serious for whatever age they're at, um, those are opportunity moments. Uh, they are the most critical moments of shaping the heart is when they do something wrong. So it's not, uh, don't get angry when they do something wrong. It's especially the more serious it is, the greater of the opportunity. And that's when you sit down and you instruct them. That's when you say, hey, we all make mistakes. We even make really dumb mistakes. But how do you feel about the mistake that you made? And what do you think that God thinks about that mistake? And what are you trying, how, what kind of character are you trying to create in yourself? What is the desire of your heart? How do you see yourself, uh, what you see yourself looking like uh, in three weeks, in three months, in three years? How can we get there? And does this action help you get there? And the more you begin to reason with them and talk with them like real people, uh, it creates respect. From the, from the child to the parent, because the child feels like you're talking to them as a real person. You're not talking at them like a dog, but you're talking to them like a real person. They listen and they respect what you're saying because you're talking on their level and what you're saying will make sense, okay? You know you're right, morality and ethics-wise and scripture-wise, but they don't know that. So you've got to begin to communicate with them in ways that will help them uh, respect you and realize that, hey, man, mom, dad, they that makes sense. And, and they adopt that belief system, okay? So enough of that, but I think it's important that, that, uh, that we talk about that. All right, let's read uh, Numbers 22, 22 through 33. Here we go. So yes, God's anger uh, arose, and the angel of the Lord 
Yahweh Sevaot, by the way, is uh, what that uh, is in the Hebrew, took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. So this is a situation here where um, the donkey is seeing the angel. Balaam can't see the angel, and he's responding in the natural, in a natural way uh, that many people might respond. Let's continue and see how this plays out. Then the angel, then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've abused me, I was wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. I think it's very interesting that he says, If there was a sword in my hand, I would kill you. And the angel is the one who has the sword and says the same thing to Balaam. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you before? And Balaam said, no. Now, I don't know about you, what stranger, the donkey talking or Balaam talking back? Uh, that's really, okay, so the angel, the, so, the, so God opened up the mouth of the donkey is one thing, but Balaam responds as if he's been talking to donkeys his entire life. Uh, but I don't know. He's been talking to the gods. Uh, so maybe we could say he's been talking to donkeys <laughs> his whole life. All right. Sorry. That was a dad joke. Uh, my wife would be proud. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, verse 31. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his hell, his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these past three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have also killed you by now and let her live. So what's, what's interesting about this a particular passage? Well, let's just go straight to the question. Let's do that. Let's go straight to the question here and discuss this. How do you think Balaam was feeling when the donkey was not going in the direction that Balaam wanted to go? Do you think he's still traveling with the bishops and the princes of Balak? How would this affect his situation? This is a kind of a point that we, we, we should talk about because we can make these very much easy connections in our own lives because as Balaam is going along with the donkey on the road, he's in an open field. First, he's in an open field. The donkey has the right to go to the left, go to the right, but he's still moving forward, okay? Balaam brings him back, brings her back, but they're still moving forward. In the same way, how many times in our own walk with the Father, we go off the path, but and we get out in the, in the muddy areas and the byways, and then God has to bring us back, but we've still gone forward a little bit. But we're not catching it. We're not catching that that situation took us off course. And then the next thing we know, now we're in a, a, a tight place where we can't go to the left or to the right. And then uh, God brings another scenario in our life. We're still not catching it that we're going the wrong way. And so now there is pain that's inflicted. God's ratcheted this thing up. We still don't get it. So what happens? He creates another situation. Even though we're moving forward, we hit the, the, the sidewall, but we're still moving forward. And then all of a sudden, a situation is created where your whole life stops. The donkey stops. Whatever you're riding, whatever you're counting on, whatever you're relying on, doesn't work. It stops. And you find yourself 
on your knees before an angel of the Lord with his sword drawn at your neck because you can't hear or recognize or perceive the things that are happening around you. This is a difficult situation for Balaam because he's not just traveling by himself. He's with an entire company of people. This would have been humiliating, embarrassing that a donkey is causing him all kinds of fits. And we know that Balaam is not a poor man. He's probably a very rich man because he's, he's, he's doing all this for hire. People are paying him money left and right, probably a line a mile long. If everybody wants to know everything, is it a boy? Is it a girl? Call upon the God for this. I need more water for my, for my uh, grain and so on and so forth. He certainly has enough money to buy a good donkey, but this donkey is out of control. So the question becomes this. I, I like this question, so I'm going to put this one back on the, on, the, on the screen. Why did Yahweh open the eyes of the donkey and not Balaam's first? Later, the angel of the Lord says in verse 33 that if the donkey had not turned aside, the angel would have killed Balaam. So why did God seemingly protect Balaam from the angel of the Lord three times? Think about this. Why? I've never asked that question before in all the years I've been teaching the Torah and teaching this particular uh, Torah portion. I don't recall ever even noticing this. But why did God open up the eyes of the donkey first? Because at the end of the day, it saved Balaam's life because the angel was going to kill him. And the answer is obvious. Balaam's normal contact with the gods came through witchcraft. Let me go back to, the, to our PDF. And divination. To experience a God outside of that context would have been extremely unusual. I believe that God was letting him know that he would not be manipulated. And he had full control over the earth, including the animals. Also, I believe by giving Balaam three chances here, God was being consistent with his own nature of mercy. He could have allowed the angel to just kill him, but he did not. He was reinforcing his own strength and power over Balaam. Even in Balaam's sin, even in Balaam's, what the Bible calls, what God says, is a perverse way. Direct disobedience is perverse. Trying to get your own way when God said no is perverse. It's as perverse as homosexuality or any kind of sexual sin. It's perverse to him. Think about that. That greed is the same perversity as homosexuality. It's actually listed in the New Testament as one of the, uh, the, the, the components or lifestyles that cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Everybody wants to easily and quickly point out that homosexuality uh, will not, homosexuals will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But they forget in the same verse, it says alcoholics and people that are greedy. People that live a lifestyle of Balaam, of full of greed. It's all about them. There's no giving back. There's no surrendering of self for someone else. Ultimately, that's part of the doctrine of Balaam that we're going to talk about. So, let's go back to, uh, to our PDF here. You can follow along. We're going to read Numbers 22, verse 34. So we'll come over here. It says this. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. This is interesting. Balaam says he did not know that God was standing against him. Now that we can understand what was happening with the donkey, what could Balaam have done differently that would have opened his eyes sooner to what was happening. This is a really good Bible study discussion point. This is where you stop and you let people think. Why did God do this? And what could Balaam have done differently to recognize that there was a problem? And let them just give the answers. Let them discuss, uh, you know, think through. Okay, he's on a donkey. The donkey does this. Then the donkey does that. Then the donkey does this. And then God opens his eyes. There was a three-step process before God revealed what was really going to happen. How many of you remember in the scriptures where it says that 
Israel was so far removed from the Lord in the wilderness that that the Holy Spirit went from being in the Holy of Holies to over the top of the holy place to at the threshold, and then he left. The pillar of fire just left. He had enough, and then everyone realized the God of Israel was gone. Three chances, and you're out. And that's exactly what's happening here. And so I believe that the answer is this. Sometimes in life, because we're not continually seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, God must get our attention through the circumstances along our journey. Many times he allows negative things to happen. This is not to hurt us, but to protect us from an even greater danger. His hope is that in these negative circumstances where things don't go as we've planned, that we would get some time out and question whether or not we are in line with his will. God not only speaks to us through his word and through prayer, but also through the physical world around us. We simply don't take time to perceive what's happening around us that might be from him. He is always speaking. We're just not always listening or perceptive enough to realize it or interpret it. So this is an important point to to really uh, labor and to talk about is the fact that God is speaking. Matter of fact, this is one of the most powerful principles that we can pull out of the entire story is that God was speaking through the donkey, but Balaam couldn't hear even though the donkey was supernaturally speaking to him. That's an incredible thing if, if, you, if you think about it. These three things happen, and the, then there's a supernatural encounter with the donkey before there is the encounter with the, with the death angel, if you will. How many times in our lives do situations happen? We just don't catch it. Get, catch it. We, don't, we don't get it. Uh, when it begins to happen in our life, where things begin to unravel, things are not going our way, I want to teach you a phrase that, that I've said many times, but it's called divine assistance. It's called grace, ultimately, the power to accomplish the will of God, not just unmerited favor. That's one definition of grace. But the definition of grace that I'm talking about tonight is the power to accomplish the will of God. When you do not have grace, you'll know it because things just aren't working out. Things that that you have planned are just kind of falling apart. They're just not falling into place like you thought they would. It's at those moments that you need to ask yourself, is the donkey getting off the path? Is the donkey pushing up against the rock? Is the donkey laying down right now in protest because I'm not seen to get to go anywhere? And uh, that's the moment where you need to ask yourself, I might be out of the will of God. I think I need to re- refresh here. I need to go back and I need to retrace my steps and go back to the place where there was grace, where there was power, uh, where there was peace. So when you don't have peace and when there's chaos, when, when, you, when you don't have peace and there's chaos, that is a big red flag, ladies and gentlemen, that you might be out of the will of God. You want to be in the will of God? Always have a sense of peace. Make sure it lines up with the will of God, and uh, and you will discover yourself almost dead center every single time. You'll have the power, you'll have peace uh, when you and and when you don't go against the word of God, you almost always know you're in the word of God, will of God. Okay. In Numbers twenty three and twenty four, it says this. Balaam gives the three prophecies. We're not going to go through it. Now, in my family, we read through the whole thing. So you can, you can have a two-hour Bible study, or you can summarize the, these couple chapters if you want. I'm going to summarize them. This is when Balaam gives the three prophecies. Uh, God goes ahead and tells him, fine, go ahead and go. Don't you dare say anything that I don't say, that I don't tell you. At this point, I think Balaam, uh, his attention has been uh, uh, lifted by Yahweh, and uh, he's going to say what uh, he's supposed to say. But Balaam gives the three prophecies in the land of King Balak, which is the land of Moab. These are Moabites. And all three ended up being blessings and not curses, as Balak desired. At the end of his third prophecy, something amazing happens. So King Balak, he wants Israel to be cursed. But all three times, Balaam ends up blessing Israel. And then this is what happens in Numbers 24, verse 9. It says, he bows down. 
He's talking about Israel. He lies down as a lion. And as he's prophesying, he says, And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Think about this, my friends. Balaam is actually quoting God himself in, I believe it's uh, Genesis chapter 12, yeah, verse 3, where God tells Abraham that whoever blesses you, I'm going to bless. Whoever curses you, I'm going to curse. So the first time that God says that is in Genesis 12, 3. Balaam has no idea that God said that to Abraham, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he literally quotes that. And what's so ironic about this is that King Balak in the very beginning says, hey, Balaam, I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. So come and help me curse Israel. And it's, the irony is great here, and it's perfect for this moment because God speaks through Balaam's mouth directly to Balak, who literally said out of his mouth that Balaam could curse and could bless at will. And Yahweh says, blessed is the one who blesses Israel and cursed is the one who curses Israel. Nobody can, can curse Israel. Only Israel can curse Israel, and we're good at at doing that, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But Balak literally is warned out of his uh, uh, of hearing out of Balaam's own mouth that if you want to curse Israel, you will be cursed. And who is Israel? The people of God. Israel literally means in the ancient Hebrew to struggle with God is to rule with God. It goes back to the time when Jacob wrestled with the angel. And so we, that struggle with God. Do you ever feel like you're struggling with God, by the way? Let's just take a moment out and get real. Do you ever feel like you're struggling with God? That's because you are Israel. You are in the lineage of, of, of the, the tribes of Israel. You are grafted into the commonwealth. And that is what we do. We struggle with God. And in the process of not letting go, and getting up every time we mess up, and moving forward, that gives us the right to rule. Israel was not perfect. They made mistakes. But God came to them every time they repented. Every single time that they repented, He came back, forgave their sin, and then poured out His grace, His unmerited favor, and the power to accomplish His will to take over that next territory. God wants you to take over territory. And that's what this whole journey is all about of being an Israelite is discovering what it's like to mess up, trying not to mess up next time, getting back up on our feet, receiving the anointing back, the grace and the power to accomplish His will, and beating and defeating that city that defeated you the first time. Okay? Uh, and by the way, uh, let, let's talk about this for a second. While King Balak believed that Balaam had the ability to bless and curse at will for money, Balaam sets the record straight. Under the Holy Spirit's power, like I said, no one can curse Israel because they are blessed. They are blessed simply by being his people and staying in covenant with him. Do you want to be blessed? Be a part of his people. You want to stay blessed? Stay in covenant with him. Okay? While it would appear that Balaam learned his lesson, and had developed a respect for the God of Israel, later he proved that Balaam was still for hire and did everything he, did, he could do to curse Israel. How do we know that? Because we see it over here in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who love the wages of unrighteousness. So in Peter, you have the author telling, telling us that there is a group of people, people that went astray and they made following the God of Israel all about themselves. They took the wages of unrighteousness. They chose to do what's wrong, but still call upon the name of the Lord. That is the doctrine of Balaam. Let's go over to Jude one eleven. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So we see here that, that Jude tells us that the way of, of Balaam for money 
is the same thing and the same attitude that Cain had and connects it to Korah. What was the story of Korah? Korah was trying to go after the throne of Moses. He was trying to usurp authority for himself. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about money or greed. It has to do with all about the power of yourself. It is trying to manipulate God for your own gain and uh, and still call upon the name of the Lord as your God, quote unquote. That is part of the doctrine of Balaam. But let's look a little deeper. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, it says, but I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexuality, sexual immorality. So we see here, my friends, that part of the doctrine of Balaam is that there was greed. They wanted nothing, uh, but uh, people that have the doctrine of Balaam built inside of them, life is about themselves. It's about proclaiming everything about themselves, and they use people for their own personal gain. It's not about blessing someone else. It's certainly not about increasing the kingdom of heaven, but it's all about blessing themselves. That's what the doctrine of Balaam is all about. Uh, the doctrine of Balaam, it, part of it, it was, is putting a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel. Now, this one can get dicey because by extension, if you create a stumbling block, in front of children, then you are following in the mindset and the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam is all about trickery, deceit. It's all about doing something that is deceitful so that you can get something out of it. Or perhaps, maybe, quite frankly, it's operating in a position of compromise in front of someone else and causing them to stumble. For instance, let's just say that, that you have alcohol in your house and you drink alcohol and you don't see any problem with it. Oh, and the Bible says there's no problem with it either. Okay, that's fine. So we're going to justify our actions and possibly being a stumbling block in front of our children who are seeing this compromise even by the world's standard. Okay, even by the world's standards. And, uh, and that causes them potentially to want to drink alcohol because dad drinks alcohol and they don't have dad's discipline and they end up getting drunk and killing a young uh, woman and end up going to jail. By the way, that's a true story. And so when we talk about compromise in front of our children, we're putting a stumbling block, a potential stumbling block in front of them. So you can extend uh, this doctrine out because it is Balaam that caused the children of Israel to fall and to commit, uh, to commit, uh, to create a curse in their own life. Josephus, let's go back to, to this here. This is important for you to see. Josephus further illustrates this by telling us that it was Balaam. It was Balaam's idea to help Balak curse the Israelites by getting them to curse themselves. Balaam knew that it was against God's law for the Israelite men to marry the daughters of Moab. He instructed them to send out their most beautiful women to entice the men of Israel, which would then bring a curse upon them. It worked. And that created a giant problem. It created a plague, in fact, that killed 24,000 men of Israel until Phinehas comes around. And he was so, so zealous for God's law and to make sure that uh, that that the law of God was, was followed, that he killed a Moabite woman and uh, that man of Israel, and that ended the plague immediately. And so uh, we find ourselves with some final questions here. So let's finish up. What is the doctrine of Baal? That what we want in life is more important and we can use people or even God to get it. That's part of the doctrine of Baal. Uh, we want what we want and we'll use whoever we got to use to get it. That somehow making sacrifices to God justifies us for doing what we want. Another part of the doctrine of Balaam is that one can follow the ways of the world and still serve God. And you can talk about that with your, with your kids is that, that, and those that are in your Bible study. That the world will absolutely begin to infuse itself upon us. 
And we have two choices. We can either compromise or we can, uh, we can move into holiness and a set apartness where we don't compromise. The doctrine of Bal- Balaam says we can compromise and we can do the things of the world and still call upon the name of the Lord. We can't do that. And then lastly, mixing sexual immorality with the service of God says it's acceptable. The doctrine of Balaam says it's acceptable when it's certainly not acceptable at all. Okay? And so as we move through here, let me get back to here. I'm going to take a few questions here, but I think it's important for all of us to understand that the doctrine of Balaam shows up all over the place today. Uh, We find ourselves in positions where we compromise the Word of God. We compromise our relationships. We do what we want to do. It's all about the I, I, I and the selfish motivation. This Torah portion and this story in Scripture is all about two things. It's all about what it looks like when we move into greed, that we end up dying because ultimately Balaam gets killed, okay? And he gets judged harshly for this. The Moabites get so punished by God uh, that they're never allowed to be part uh, of the children of Israel under any stretch of imagination. Now, what's interesting about this, that curse ends with Ruth. Because where is Ruth from? She's a Moabite. So Ruth the Moabite is not allowed to be a part of the people of God, but she leaves and forsakes that lifestyle, removes herself from that curse by the mere fact that she removes herself from the curse by choosing not to compromise and leaving her people. She removes herself from the curse and allows herself to be part of Israel. And so I hope that encourages you. There's a lot that we can talk about that you can talk about when you do your family church. And, um, and so I encourage you to go back through this PDF, make sure that you understand the story and let the Holy Spirit bring out as many principles as you possibly can. Someone has donated to this ministry so that you could be blessed today. Would you consider paying it forward for others? If so, text pay it forward, all one word to 801 801- 801. That's pay it forward, no spaces, to 801-801 or go to passionfortruth.com.